Thank you for listening to this recent message from the Rescue Church. We pray that God will use this message to encourage, challenge, and inspire you on your faith journey. If you'd like to learn more about the Rescue Church, please visit us online at therescuechurch.com. I want to I start today by asking a question of you, and this is what is known as a rhetorical question, so you don't have to raise your hand or shout out loud, but I want you to think about this for just a minute. Here it is. The question is, why are you here today? Why did you come here? Now, some of you may say, I don't really know why I came here. I just saw people walking in a building, and so I came in a building. I showed up, don't really know what's going on. Uh, some of you may say, well, I always come here. This is just what I do. Uh, some of you may say, well, John, it's Easter. It's what you do. You get up and you go to church on Easter, and so you're here. But I, I want to I propose something to you. What if, what if the reason that you're here is not really the reason that you're here? Say, what are you talking about? What if... What if God actually brought you here this morning because he wants to say something to your heart? And when I start saying what I'm about to say this morning and the words that come out of my mouth, if you start feeling like he is saying that directly to me, that's not because I've been creeping on you. I've not been reading your emails. I've not been looking in your house windows. When, when you have that sensation in church, when you're like, that pastor's talking directly to me, you need to understand something. That's the Holy Spirit of God calling you out. And I believe he brought some people here today. You might have just thought it's Easter and you're coming to church because that's what you do. But I believe God might have brought you here today because he has something very specific he wants to say to your life. What you're about to hear, if you apply it to your life, literally could change your life here and now. And it could change your eternal destiny. Are you guys excited to hear a word from the Lord this morning? All right, very good. Here we go. We're going to go to the book of Mark, chapter 16. Today is Easter. It's one of the greatest Sundays, one of the greatest celebrations that we have in the Christian faith. And we're going to go to the gospel of Mark and look at his story, his account of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, if you're not a, a student of the Bible, let me just tell you, the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're, they're what we call the gospel accounts. They, they tell the same story, but they focus on it from four different authors. And it tells the story of the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. So we're going to go to Mark 16, and we're going to hear a little uh, snippet of Mark's story of the resurrection of Jesus, okay? And uh, I want to tell you, if you don't have a Bible, it's okay. The, the screen, we'll have the verses up on the screens here in Flandreau and Coleman. Uh, we also want to tell you this. If you don't have a Bible, but you have a smartphone, uh, we've got an app, the Rescue Church app. You can download that app for free, and inside there, there's a free Bible. We'd love to give it to you. We really believe that it's important for you to have the Word of God and to, to know the Word of God. That way you can fact check everything I'm saying up here. We don't believe you should just take spoon-fed what a pastor says. You need to go open the Word of God for yourself and say, is that pastor really telling me the truth? And so I just dare you, back everything up I say this morning with the Word of God. You go see if I'm not preaching from the Word of God this morning. Mark chapter 16, starting in verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. Here's the context. Jesus was crucified on Friday. Okay? He was taken down off the cross, put in a tomb before Saturday, before the Sabbath. And then this story picks up here. Saturday evening, when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, that's also the mother of Jesus, and Salome went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. Let me just quickly say this so you understand. In this culture and, and in this day and age, this was a very common ritual that you would do when someone died. You would get spices and you'd go anoint the body of that, that deceased loved one or friend or whatever. And it's what we would call today kind of similar to just taking flowers to a cemetery or to a graveside. You know, it's just kind of a common Ritual, And I want to just say this before we get any further into the story, because I believe this is a word for someone listening to this today. I believe just like these women got these burial spices and they came to the tomb, check it out, they came to the tomb expecting a ritual, just another ordinary ritual. But what we're about to see they experienced was a miracle. And I believe there's some people today that you just got up and you came to church because it's Easter. It's kind of the thing to do. And you just kind of came expecting a ritual. But my prayer for you and my belief for you is that today could be a day that you experience the miracle of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. You just thought it was going to be another ordinary day in church. And Jesus is about to rock your world. So get ready for it. These ladies came just expecting a normal ritual, a normal of a body and they were about to be blown away by what they found next sentence says this very early everybody say very early. very early 
very early, oh, time out. How many of you are morning people? Raise your hand, morning people. All the morning people, their hands just shot up right now. They're like, woo, I love the morning. You've had your coffee, you're excited. I would have asked how many of you are night people, but I know it's too early to even ask. You, have, ugh, you haven't had enough coffee to even raise your hand. I got to tell you something, everybody. You ready for this? All you night people who like to stay up late, you think that's good for you? Um, Y'all would have missed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm just saying, all right? Uh, so those of us morning people, we got the moral high ground on this one. Jesus is on our side, all right? He's a morning person. He got up early in the morning, very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb, all right? Next verse, verse 3, it says this, on the way... They were asking each other, look at this question they were asking one another. Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? So these women knew where Jesus was buried. They knew that a large stone had been rolled in front of the door of the tomb. And as they were on their way to do this ritual anointing of Jesus' body, they said, who's going to roll away this stone? And I believe it's possible that I'm speaking to someone here this morning that you walk through the doors of the Flandreau campus or the Coleman campus or you logged on to our I campus, and even though you might have dressed up a little bit because it's Easter and even though you might have a smile on your face and even though we may not be able to see through all of that, I believe I'm speaking to some people this morning that you're asking the very same question about a very large stone in your life, an immovable object that you're up against. And you're saying to yourself, who's going to roll away this huge stone that's in front of me? I can't go over it, I can't go around it, I can't go under it, I can't go through it. This is too big for me. It might be an addiction that you're struggling with that no one else knows about. It might be a problem in your marriage where you're like, man, if they only knew how close our marriage is to, to just being over. It might be a problem with the child that you're experiencing. It might be a financial problem. It might be a health issue. It might be something that in, in your workplace, but you're dealing with something that is too big for you to overcome. I know I'm speaking to somebody this morning when I say that. I want you to see what happened with these women. They're on their way to the tomb. Who's going to move this big object that we can't move? Verse 4 says this, but as they arrived, they, what does it say? They looked up. Oh my goodness, this will preach all day long. When they arrived, they looked up and they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. You see, these ladies, as they were on their way to the tomb, they're wondering, who's going to take care of this problem for us? Who's going to move this object that we can't move? And what they didn't realize was that the resurrected Jesus Christ had already overcome the obstacle that they could not move. But see, the key, they had to look up. See, I believe I'm talking to some people this morning that that insurmountable obstacle in your way that you've been trying to come, you've been looking in the wrong place. You've been looking in because that's what our world tells us. When you've got problems, when you've got struggles, look within yourself. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Try harder. Get up earlier. Go to bed later. Sleep less. Try hard. Love yourself more. Read a self-help book. Look within. But what the Word of God would have to say to us, the Scriptures tell us that when we look inside, outside of Jesus Christ, without Jesus Christ, when we look into our life, there's not much good to be found there. And there's a reason you have not yet overcome that obstacle in your life. You've tried. And maybe you're not there yet. Maybe I'm speaking to some people that still have the world by the tail. You're still 12 and know everything, and that's cool. Okay, but I promise the day will come that you will find yourself up against an obstacle that's too big for you to move. And when you try and find the answer from within, you won't find it there. I might be speaking to some people today that you've stopped looking in, and you've become so discouraged and dejected and defeated that now you're looking down. And you might have come to this Easter service today with your head hanging low because you've tried so long to overcome this thing and you can't. And I want to encourage anyone who may just be looking down in defeat or anyone who may be looking within to find the strength or the answer, you're looking in the wrong place. Just like these women, you need to look up to the risen Savior because He has already given you the power to overcome whatever that thing is that you're struggling and up against. When you came into church this morning, everyone was given a little rock, okay? Just a little tiny rock. This is not to throw at the preacher, okay, during church if he goes too long because that's a very real possibility in this place. I'm just saying. I want you to check out this rock. Here's, here's why I gave you this rock. I want this rock to be just a simple little visual tool. I'm a visual guy. When I see it, when I can hold it in my hands, it, 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 it's so much easier for me to grasp a concept. I, I want this simple little visual rock just to be a visual reminder 
to you of a profound truth. And maybe, I, I should have done this, but this would have taken a really long time. Maybe you should write on this rock, John 16, 33. You don't have to do it now. Your, your ink pen probably won't even work on it. But, but John 16, 33, write that down. You can remember that for later. If you look that verse up, what you'll find is Jesus is right before he's crucified and, and led away and, and arrested. He's having kind of his last supper with his disciples, and he tells them something. He kind of tells them of the things to come, and he's like, hey, guys, here's what's about to go down. I'm going to be arrested. You all are going to run away from me and, and abandon me. And so he's delivering them this heavy news. But then he says these crazy words in John 16, 33. He says, uh, I tell you these things that you might have peace. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. There will be difficult obstacles in your way that you cannot overcome. But then he says, but take heart because I have overcome the world. I've taken that very large stone and I've made it movable. Outside of me, it's a huge rock that you can't overcome, you can't move. But with me, I've made this thing very movable. So you just take that rock and remember that as you're struggling through something. We serve a risen Savior who's overcome the world and made the immovable movable. Let's continue the story. Verse 5, okay? So here are these ladies. They show up. The tomb's empty. The, 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 the stone's been rolled away. And, and here's what verse 5 says. When they entered the tomb, they walked into the tomb now, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side the women were shocked. Everyone say shocked. I'm shocked too. If I walk into an empty tomb expecting to see the dead body of my friend, Jesus Christ, and, and instead I see an angel. Now let's, let me tell you this. Let me tell you. Here's how my imagination works, and I don't think this is too far from reality. I don't think God has any sissy pants angels, okay? I think God's angels are buff and strong. I mean, like, imagine me with just a little more bulk, like that. You know, big, <laughs> strong, muscular, ripped guys standing there in a blazing white robe. And this is hilarious to me. The angel says to them, don't be alarmed. Nothing to see here. Just an empty tomb and an angel. Move along. Nothing to see here. Keep going. And look at what the angel says to these ladies. He says, you are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. And here's the most foundational words of the Christian faith. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Can I get a shout of praise to the risen Savior from his church this morning? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. And look what the angel says. He's like, look, this is where they laid his body. Look, look at here, ladies. Check it out. Here's where Jesus was lying. He's not here anymore. See, I've heard it said before that uh, the, the, the stone was not rolled away from the entrance of the tomb so that Jesus could get out. It's not like Jesus was sitting there going, um, excuse me, God, could you move the rock? I need to get out and tell everyone I'm alive. Um, the, the stone was rolled away so that we could get in and we could examine the evidence of a tomb that was empty. And here's these ladies going to mourn the loss of their son and their friend, Jesus, and anoint his body. And they come, and the stone is rolled away. And an angel's there saying, you're looking for a dead guy? He ain't here because he ain't dead. He's alive. Now look at what he says next to him. The angel says this, and this is amazing. Verse 7, he says, now go tell his disciples. Look at the next two words. Including who? Peter. Including Peter that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee, you will see him there just as he told you before he died. Now, understand this. When an angel speaks, I believe he's delivering the word of God. He's a messenger of God. So this is basically God's word to these women. Go tell the disciples and Peter that Jesus is alive. Now, check it out. If you're not aware of the backstory that's behind this, you'll just read right on past this verse and it won't mean anything to you. But i got to take just a second and explain this. Why did the angel speak God's word to these women and say, don't just tell the disciples, tell the disciples, including Peter? You know why he said that? Remember what happened with Peter? Peter utterly, utterly betrayed Jesus. He had a huge failure. And the story there is, and you can go read it on your own, but basically here's the story. When Jesus was telling his disciples everything that was going to go down, I'm going to be arrested, they're going to lead me away, you all are going to run away like scaredy cat uh, little girls. And, uh, and Peter said, said, no, never, Lord. I will never abandon you. I will die with you. If I need to die with you, I will die with you. And Jesus said, hey, Peter, check it out. Before the rooster crows, that's kind of modern way of saying, before the alarm clock goes off on your iPhone, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny, not once, not twice, three times, you're going to deny that you even know my name. And that's exactly what happened. 
The, the soldiers came and they arrested Jesus and the disciples all ran away. They all betrayed their Savior, their Lord, their friend. Peter then called out by a little, probably seventh grade girl who asked the simple question, hey, aren't you one of his disciples? Aren't you one of his followers? Aren't you with him? Peter denied that he even knew Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. Can you imagine the failure Peter must have felt having betrayed his Savior? And now here's the angel saying, I want you to go tell the disciples and Peter as well. See, I think that's a word for someone today because I believe there's someone today that that is the thing that's really keeping you from stepping across the line of faith into a personal relationship with Jesus. You're listening to a voice that's telling you, I have messed up too much for God to love me. I have messed up too much. I've failed and betrayed my God so much. He couldn't take me back again. And I believe you could honestly insert your name into that verse. Go tell the rescue church, including you, that Jesus is alive. He wants to do some business with you. All right, so here's what we're going to do in the time that we have left. I want to now focus in on Peter's story. And I kind of want to walk you through Peter's reaction to this news that the ladies are about to take to the disciples, that, hey, Jesus is alive. And I want to help you visually. I've got some chairs up here on the stage because I want you to see kind of the process that Peter went through after he received this news about Jesus being alive. So if you would, flip in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. We're going we're gonna to let Luke take over the story from here because he's going to pick up the story where the ladies come to the disciples and give them this news that Jesus is alive, okay? Luke chapter 24, if you've got your Bibles and want to join me there, I'm going to start in verse 9. It says this, When they, they being the ladies, when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all the others. The eleven is the disciples, because they had twelve, they lost Judas, because he betrayed Jesus and sold him out, and then he went out and committed suicide and hung himself. So when it says the eleven, it's just referring to the, the disciples, Peter's in this bunch, by the way. They, they said these things to the eleven and to all the others. Now, here's the response, okay, of the, the disciples. They're like, well, of course, ladies, we know this. We're sitting here having a faith-filled prayer meeting and just expressing our bold confidence in our Lord. We knew he was going to rise again. That, that's what they said. Is that their response to the ladies? Yeah. No. As a matter of fact, here's what we see in these men. And before we, before we kind of throw them under the bus, you need to understand something. And put yourself in their shoes. They had been with Jesus for three years. They had heard him talk about coming into his kingdom and bringing the kingdom of God with them. And they had watched him back up all of his claims about being God by raising people from the dead and healing blind people and causing people who've never walked in their life to stand up and walk and feeding large crowds with just a little bit of food. They watched Jesus spit in people's eyes and bring their, their eyesight back. They watched Jesus do amazing things. They heard him teach in amazing ways. And then they watched that man who they thought was God, who they believed was the promised Messiah, they watched him die on a cross. To say that their faith had been rocked to the core would be an understatement. These guys just watched Jesus die. And so before we throw them under the bus, here's where they were. I probably would have been right there in the midst of them. They were hiding in a room, afraid of the other religious leaders who had kind of helped put Jesus to death. And they're hiding out going, what do we do now? This dude told us he was the Messiah. We drank the Kool-Aid. He died. Now what? And then here comes the ladies. Here come the ladies running in. And obviously if God wanted a message out, he gave it to the ladies so he knew it would spread around, right? So he gave it to the ladies. The ladies come running. Sorry, ladies, just kidding. And, and here's, so the ladies tell the 11, hey, guys, he's alive. We saw an empty tomb and an angel, and he said to come to tell you guys. And here was their response. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like what? Nonsense. Nonsense. That is the most foolish thing I've ever heard. We watched him get beaten beyond recognition of a man. We watched him drag his cross through the streets of Jerusalem. We watched them nail his feet and hands to that cross. We watched him be impaled to that and, and suspended from the cross. We watched him hang there in agony for hours. We saw the crown of thorns on his head. We saw all the blood. We saw the spear go into his side. He's dead. This is nonsense, ladies. What are you talking about? So here's, here's where Peter starts his journey. I'm just going to have a seat in this chair that defines and represents those who would say, I'm kind of skeptical when it comes to all of this Jesus stuff. 
Because to be honest, it seems like a lot of nonsense to me. And I just want to say something to anyone here that might be listening to this and would say, you know, that's kind of where I'm at. I'm kind of a skeptical, you know, maybe I even, maybe I even define myself as an atheist. I just want to join you for a minute in that and tell you something. If all of these crazy Christians down here on this end of the scale are wrong about what they believe, I just want you to just acknowledge this. Let's, let's be honest. Christians believe some pretty crazy stuff. We do. We believe in a God who has existed without any help outside of man, outside of space, outside of time, outside of matter. We believe in a God who spoke this world into existence and spoke creation into being. We believe in a God who created us out of the dust of the earth. He formed man and made us with an eternal soul. We believe that, that man sinned against that God, and we believe that, uh, that God then sent his only son, Jesus, and it's three gods in one person, but one God in three manifestations. It's like, well, what, how does that? I don't even know how to explain that. But he sent his son, Jesus, to come and live a perfect life and die on a cross and take all of the sin of the world upon himself and he was born of a virgin and we just believe some pretty outlandish things and if you've ever sat in this chair where you go I don't know if I can believe all that I just want you to know that Peter started here as well the guy who went on to plant what we now know as the local New Testament church and boldly share his faith he started out as a skeptic I want you to know there was a time in my life I grew up in the church I grew up in a Christian family so I kind of just accepted dad and mom's teachings, you know, about my faith. But I went through a period in my life, and I think everyone needs to go through this, where I started asking some hard questions of my own faith. I'm skeptical about some things, and I need some answers. And that's where Peter started. So if you're here in this chair, I just want you to know it's okay to be here, but I want to challenge you. It's not really okay to stay here. I want you to see what happens next with Peter, okay? He runs to the empty tomb. Verse 12 says this. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Is Peter an all-in committed believer and follower of Jesus yet at this point? Nope. But he's no longer totally skeptical because now he's slid over into this chair that I'm going to say kind of represents that of a seeker. Because Peter now is saying, okay, I've seen some evidence here. There's something to this whole empty tomb thing. I see the grave clothes that they buried him in. They're folded up. They're sitting right there. But Jesus isn't here. And so he went away kind of scratching his head, wondering to himself, I wonder what happened. I wonder what happened with all this Jesus stuff. I believe I'm speaking to some people here today in Flandreau and in Coleman that this is where you're at right now. You're searching. And you have questions. And here's my challenge for you. I want to challenge you to do the exact same thing that Peter did. I want to challenge you to run to the empty tomb and start to examine the evidence of the empty tomb for yourself. Check it out. If, if you're in this chair right here, if you're kind of in that chair of skepticism, here's what I got. Here's my word of caution to you. If you are right, if there is no God, if all this stuff about Jesus and an empty tomb is a made-up hoax, just made up by a bunch of religious zealots, then, then you're, if you're right, we are some of the biggest fools that have ever lived as Christians because we've believed one of the biggest lies that has ever been told. And if you're right, you die, and we die, and we all go to the same place, which is just the dirt that we evolved from, and there is no God, there is no creator, there is no purpose in life, and, and we just kind of look foolish at the end of the day. But the reason I would challenge you to slide on over into this seat for a little while and become a seeker and a searcher for the truth is this. If you're wrong, if you're wrong about your belief that this empty tomb and a resurrected Savior is not real, there is a literal eternal hell to pay. And so I would boldly challenge you not to take spoon-fed the truth claims of your college professor or your parents who said there is no God and there is no Jesus and he was just a man. And I would encourage you to run to the empty tomb. You know, I believe that there again are some people sitting in this seat as a seeker and a searcher and you're saying, you know, I, I want to I, I wanna know the truth. I want to know the truth. I'm not an atheist. I believe that there probably is a God, but here's my biggest challenge. Here's my biggest problem. I know what I've done in my life, and I don't know how a God could love someone like me. I don't know how God could forgive me for all of the stuff that's in my past. Before we move to the next chair, I want you to watch this video that is going to uh, portray 
something that happened between Jesus and Peter on a beach because this is the moment of life change if you'll accept it. Go ahead and roll this video, please. Grace is God's unmerited favor for us, his crazy love. And the truth is, many times we struggle understanding it. If you find yourself struggling to understand God's grace, don't beat yourself up. Even the disciples struggled with understanding grace. Jesus, is that you? You're alive. I can't believe you're alive. Okay, I was in the boat, and I wasn't catching any fish, okay? But I heard this voice, and the voice said, cast your net to the other side. And so I'm thinking, I'm a fisherman. I know what I'm doing, but I'm not catching any fish, you know? And so I throw that net over there, and then a gaggle of fish pop into that net, and I'm going, this is a total miracle. Who could have done that? I need to know who told me to throw the net to the other side. And boom, I look up, and I mean, there is you. You're looking at me on the seashore going, it is I, the Lord. It's you're alive. I can't believe you're alive. This is awesome. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on. Peter, yeah. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. I love you. You're alive. This is so great. Good. And then feed my sheep. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on, man. It's him. Peter. Yeah. Do you love me? I love you. Yes. And I'm so sorry about that rooster cluck, and I had no idea what that meant, but I do now. I'm better for it. All right. Okay. Then feed my sheep. Andrew, I'm smiling, but I'm serious. Come on, get out of the boat. It's him. Peter. Yeah. Do you love me? Jesus, mere words cannot describe the passion that I have for you. I love you. You know everything. I love you. Good. Good. Then feed my sheep. I didn't even know you had livestock. That is so like you, though. There's something new about you all the time. That's what I love about you. Peter, yeah. do you remember uh, the morning the ladies went to the tomb? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're all in the upper room trying to figure out what to do next, you know, because we thought you were dead. You know, you were dead, you know, and we're trying to figure all that out, you know. And Mary comes running up, and Mary's like saying, beehive, beehive, beehive. And I'm thinking, I'm allergic to bees. Like, keep them out. You know what I'm saying? But as she kept getting closer, I heard her correctly. She was saying, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And we're going, who's alive, who's alive? And she said, she was at the tomb, and the tomb was empty. And she said that the, there was an angel there. And the angel said, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay. He is risen. And so me and John, we hightailed it down there. And if John says he beat me, he's totally lying, all right? I beat him, FYI, all right, you know? And we get down there, and I'm looking in that tomb, and it is. It is empty. There's nothing in there, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, what does this mean? What does this mean? And John is right there. John is so good with words. He should write a book. He is so good with words. And John said, don't you get it, Peter? This is everything Jesus said he was going to do, and you did it, and it's done. Let's go. This is so great. Wait, yeah. the angel said what? Uh, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay. He is risen. You've risen. Let's go. This he is okay. said what? Go tell the disciples and Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. You said my name. Why did you say my name? Peter, that's grace. No, no, I don't, I don't deserve that because that night people kept coming up to me asking me if I belonged to you, if I was with you, and I kept denying you left and right, all right? No, it'll take me my whole life to make up for what I did. It was unforgivable no, for what I did. No, What I did on the cross was meant to take what is unforgivable and make it forgivable. That's my grace. It's not about you. It's always about me. That's grace, Peter. There was an event that John writes about in John chapter 21 that these guys just kind of depicted for you, and I believe it's the moment that Peter came face to face. He moved from being a skeptic to a seeker, and he had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ that changed his life. And the story is kind of as you saw played out there. The disciples, uh, they had gone back to their fishing. You need to understand this. For them, that wasn't like, hey, what should we do today? Why don't we go fishing? Like, we go fishing. This was them saying, this Jesus thing didn't work out. We're going back to our careers that we left to follow this Jesus who's now dead. And John says they're out in their boat and they're fishing and they catch nothing. And this is very symbolic because this is kind of how they met Jesus. And, and, and in the morning, as they're kind of getting ready to wrap things up, Jesus comes walking along the shore and he calls out to them, have you caught anything? No. Throw your nets on the other side. They do. It's full of fish. And they know it's the Lord. 
And Jesus is back on the beach, and he's cooked up a little fish fry for the guys, and he calls them in, and he's feeding them breakfast. And then he pulls Peter aside, and he has this very intimate encounter with Peter that you saw portrayed there where he says, Peter, do you love me? Not once, not twice, but three times that Jesus, and obviously you see what Jesus is doing there, right? He's bringing face to face Peter to his sin and his betrayal, and he's giving Peter three opportunities to declare his love for Jesus. He's giving Peter a second chance. He's giving Peter grace and forgiveness. And see, there has to come a point in this journey that we experience the same thing Peter did, where we move from the seat of being searching and I'm looking for truth. There has to come a point where we personally cross this line of faith and we have an encounter with Jesus where we believe that he is the Son of God, that he was crucified, that he was buried, that he rose again, and we accept by faith that forgiveness. You can't earn it. You'll never be good enough. You don't deserve it, and it's called grace that you embrace, and you say, Jesus, I receive it. I accept it. And I believe this is a decision that there are some people here today that this is your day. This is your day. You're not a skeptic anymore. This is your day to move beyond seeking to a personal encounter with Jesus where you know the truth. But I got to tell you this. It doesn't stop there. So often in church, we kind of paint that third chair as the be all end all. Just this is what we kind of call getting saved. When I've had my personal encounter with Jesus, I, I'm born again. I'm saved. I've become a Christian. I'm in the family of God. I've invited Jesus into my heart. We say it in many different ways. I've accepted Christ. However you want to say it. So often we paint the picture like this is the ultimate goal just to get people to this chair. I want you to know there's one more chair that Peter walked through. There's one more response, level of response that he had to the gospel. And we won't take the time to look at it, but I'll give you the assignment of going and checking it out yourself. Read the book of Acts, the, the Acts of the early New Testament church, because Peter went from being a scared, coward, skeptical man to being a seeker searching for the truth, to having a personal encounter with Jesus, to being a fully, all-in, sold-out follower. See, there's a difference from just believing in Jesus and actually following Jesus with my life. And Peter saw God do unbelievable things in his life and through his life. You study the book of, of Acts and you see where God used Peter to be the, the guy that really started the early New Testament church. He went from being this cowardly guy to being a bold leader in the church. And I want you to know when you're living in this place in your life, this is when you start to see real life transformation. It's not you trying harder to be a better Christian. It's God through his Holy Spirit working in your heart, giving you the desire and the power to do things that you did not want to do before and could not do before. And you start to see God change you from the inside out. You get to start experiencing what it is to have God use you to impact other people, where you now become the body of Christ and you are the hands and feet of Jesus. And it is unbelievable to be in this place. And we saw Peter go through all of that as you study the life of Peter and go through that reaction. I want you to know something. Today is a day of decision for you. I believe God brought you here today. Wherever you're watching this from, I believe God has you listening to this right now because he's calling you to make a decision. So I'm going to ask you to do something this morning that's a little brave and a little bold, okay? And I'm not going to apologize for it. I'm going to ask you to make a decision. I'm going to call you to respond to this truth that you've heard. And here's where I'm going to start. I'm going to start with this way and work backwards. I'm going to start with people who claim that I have had an encounter with the risen Savior. I have put my faith and trust in Jesus. I believe I'm speaking to some people here today that if you were to be honest, you would say, I know I believe in Jesus, but if truth were to be told... I don't really think I'm living much of my life here. I don't really think I'm following much. I think I wear my Christian faith kind of generically, and I put it away very easily, and I very easily blend into the culture who doesn't claim to know and love and follow Jesus. And I'm going to ask, if there's anyone here in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to stand up that would say, I need prayer, because today I want to make a commitment from moving from just being a believer in Jesus to a follower. In that, I want to include people that may still be in this chair. I know I'm talking to some people here today that say, I, I, John, I really think that much of my life is living in that sold-out, committed follower of Jesus, but I know the truth is there are still some areas in my life that I'm holding out from him. And today, I just want to make a commitment to live my life as an all-in, sold-out follower of Jesus. In all of our locations, I'm just going to ask you, if that's you, would you stand up right now? 
I want to pray for you. I want to be an all-in, sold-out follower of Jesus Christ. I appreciate your boldness. I appreciate your honesty. Jesus bled and died on a cross. It's not asking too much that we stand for him in his house of all places. If you won't stand for Jesus here today, I promise you won't stand for him out in the culture tomorrow. Thank you for your honesty. I'm going to pray over this bunch because my prayer is that we would be a church of men and women who are like the Peter of Acts the Peter that is boldly professing his faith to the world, boldly living it out, following Jesus into some really uncomfortable places. I'll get to you in just a minute. I want to talk to anyone today that may be saying, you know what, this is my day. I've been sitting in this chair seeking. I've been a seeker. I've been searching long enough. Today is my day. I want to have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Today is the day I want to invite him to be the Lord of my life. I'm going to ask you to do something really bold right now in all of our locations. If you want to receive Jesus into your life today and know him personally, would you stand up to your feet right now and say, Today's the day I want to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Today is the day I want to step across that line of faith. Would you just stand right now to your feet and say, Lord Jesus, I, I, I want in. I'm moving from being skeptical. I'm moving from being a seeker for the truth. I believe the truth. I believe you are the living son of God. Praise God. Praise God. And to, the, to those that may be on this far end, I'm not going to embarrass you. If, if you would just be honest enough to say, yep, I'm skeptical, and, and that's kind of where I'm at right now, I seriously want to thank you for being here and listening to this. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to embarrass you. But, but here's what I would say. My challenge to you would be this. I would challenge you today to make a decision of your will, intellectual will, that you would slide over into that seat briefly to at least willingly examine the claims of Christianity with an open mind and an open heart and be willing and have the intellectual honesty to follow that evidence where it leads you. Because I promise if you stay in your seat, the word of God to you is this. There is a judgment day coming. Jesus died so that you would not have to spend eternity separated from him in a place called hell. He's throwing you a lifeline today. And if you're not ready to grab onto that lifeline and receive it, I'm at least asking you to be willing to examine the claims of that. Because what I can tell you is this, some of the greatest defenders of our faith have been men and women who set out to disprove this whole thing called Christianity. And what they found is they begin to peel into the evidence and dig into it. What they found is that there is overwhelming evidence for the bedrock foundation of our faith, that Jesus is who he says he is, that he came to this earth, that he lived a perfect life, that he died on a cross, he was buried, and he rose again. And my challenge to you today would be to at least slide over and examine the claims of Christ. I want to pray over all of us before we close out today. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this time that you've given to us. I thank you for this wonderful opportunity that you've given to me to be here today and to share your truth with these people. I pray for all of those who stood this morning. Lord, I just pray a word of blessing over this church body who stood to their feet to say, I want to move from just being a believer in Jesus to being a follower of Jesus. Lord, I pray that this would be a church full of men and women who are sold out to follow you wherever you lead, however uncomfortable that may get, that they are sold out to becoming the men and women that you're calling us to be, that through these kinds of men and women, you will change the world. Lord, I just pray that blessing over this church. Lord, I pray for those that have stood to say, I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And if that's you, if this is your day to receive Jesus, I'm just going to encourage you to speak these words from your heart to the Lord right now and say, Lord Jesus, I invite you to come into my heart to be my Savior. I receive your forgiveness from my sin. I believe that you died on a cross, that you paid the penalty for all of my sin, and I believe that you were buried and that you rose again and that the tomb is empty and you have purchased my salvation and I freely receive it today. And I want you to know if that is your prayer, that today you became a child of God. If you really prayed that and meant that prayer from your heart to the Lord, you are in the family of God. You've moved from being a seeker to being a found child of the King of Kings. And Father, I just pray for anyone here today that would say, I'm kind of still in that place Peter was where I think all of this sounds like nonsense. Lord, thank you for their honesty and their willingness to at least be truthful about that. My prayer is that just like Peter, they would at least have the intellectual honesty to run to the empty tomb and have a look for themselves and say, before I just dismiss all of this teaching about Jesus, I need to invite him to show me the truth. Lord, you've promised that if we seek the truth, that it will be found. 
that if we seek you, that your spirit will guide us into all truth. So I pray for those that are still skeptical, Lord, that they would at least be willing to say, Lord, if you're out there, if you're real, I'm asking that you would guide me into the truth and show me. I need to see it. I need to know. I need to examine the evidence for myself. Lord, I'm faithfully confident that you will show them that because you're a faithful God. And when they're really searching and seeking, they will find you. Jesus, thank you that we serve a risen Savior today, that the tomb is empty, that we serve a God who conquered sin and death and hell, and that we can move from being non-believers and skeptics to being seekers and searchers to believing in you, even greater than that, to living for you and seeing you alive in us and through us. And the change that can be brought into our world and into our families and into our marriages and into our church and into our society and into our cities because of Jesus and who you are and what you've done. Thank you for the message of Easter. And before we say amen today, I'm just going to ask God's people to put their hands together in worship to our risen Savior. And all God's people said amen. Thank you for listening to this recent message from the Rescue Church. You can listen to more past messages at therescuechurch.com. If you'd like to share how God spoke to you through this message, we'd love to hear from you. Just send your stories to therescuechurch at hotmail.com. If this message has blessed you, you can support the ministry of The Rescue Church by giving online at our website under the Donate tab. 